Alright, start of the stream. And we start the recording. Okay, and again, uh, this is Virtual Christmas Summit 2021, sponsored by Biscoyo Studios. Uh, this presentation is Moving Heads by our celebrity Tom but George. And uh, this is also sponsored by uh, CCL Controllers for the room. So, Tom, it's all yours. Take it away. All right, great. Um, I am not going to use a virtual background because I'm actually going to show you guys um, how the moving heads work first in person. Um, and the virtual background will shut that off. That's what I, I take that back. I'm going to do a very, very short slideshow. Honestly, I don't like slideshows very much because I don't find... Um, they're very helpful for myself. Um, so I'm just going to shoot through some basic information. I'm going to try to get done plenty early um, to allow enough time for questions. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen real quick. Um, do you guys see the, what's it called? Yes, we do. Robot, yeah. robot in the background? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I want to make sure you see the right screen. Okay. All right, here we go. So, yeah, my name is Tom Bet George. I am the owner of Magical Light Shows. Um, so let's talk about moving heads. Um, there's basically a few different kinds of moving heads. There's washes, beams, spots, and there's also new fixtures that have multiple use that have them all together. I'm going to go over the basic ones. Um, usually when people think of moving heads, um, or actually when you see them on, on stages, they're actually washes. Um, You'll see they'll they'll have they'll light up a general area. In the past, um, LEDs were difficult to light up human skin. Um, now they've got a little bit more advanced. And in the, in the, before they used to use incandescent or halogen bulbs or other other kind of bulb technology, um, because LEDs are very directional lights and they're very cold, um, which is part of the reason why um, we usually don't use them even today for beams. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, in this specific industry, maybe because of myself, maybe because of others, um, beams have become quite famous. The original beam that really kind of started it all is Clay Packy Sharpie. Um, Clay Packy is an Italian company. That's a Sharpie right there. When you think of beams, all these um, knockoffs and even um, U.S. knockoffs, they're basically copying what Clay Packy did. Because up to that point, typically beams were about 2,000 watts each just for the bulbs. Um, just to have it powerful enough, but Clay Packy kind of uh, pioneered the path that allows you to use um, almost like a magnifying glass that really makes a 189 watt bulb look just as powerful as a 200 watt bulb. Um, finally, there's uh, spots, which basically when you see someone on stage, but you only see them or a small area, that's a spotlight. Usually they can be controlled on how big that spot is. And of course, as I met, said earlier, there's also multiple use beams. Uh, I'm not gonna get really into that any farther, but what you probably see in my, or what you are thinking of is beams. Um, the beams, um, they literally can show a beam in the sky. Now be careful, all light needs particulate matter to um, show anything. So I guess in a space vacuum, a beam would show nothing, but you'd be surprised how dirty um, your air is. Um, even if you li li live way out in the middle of nowhere, there's often dust and there's often just uh, even moisture in the air that allows the beam to shine. The, the hardest times I've ever had a beam in the air were um, when it was extremely dry um, in a clean environment. Um, I used to live in the Bay Area, which is extremely dirty. We have lots of smog. Now I live more, slightly more out into the country, if you will. But still, there's just so much stuff in the air through either dust or other things. Um, I, did my computer locked up or something? No, no. What's happening? You guys can hear me. I apologize. Do you, you guys hear me? Oh, okay. Okay, that's good to know. Um, I wonder how to fix that because my computer, this has never happened because it happens during, um, a, I'll tell you what, while I try to figure this out, I'm going to continue talking. That way we're not getting stuck. Um, 
So basically, um, there's always stuff in the air, whether or not you, you th see it or think it, there's always something going on. I do suspect I'm going to have to restart my computer, unfortunately, because it looks like none of my programs are working, by the way. I'll just get through the rest of the talk. Um, when it comes to having your beams, um, you probably are asking, well, how do I put them outside? There are hard domes, and that is by far the most robust. Typically, hard domes are $500 and up after shipping. Um, they're the most robust. Uh, but they're kind of heavy too. They're probably about 75 pounds plus the, you know, um, actually I guess maybe up to 75 pounds plus the, the weight of the light. There's inflatable domes, which I don't recommend. They're the cheapest solution, but the problem is they don't always inflate properly, which is dangerous when you're um, running your beams. And finally, now today they have a lot of IP67 rated fixtures, which means you can put them directly outside. They are cool and the fact that they're easiest to set up, but they also, um, tend to fail prematurely because they overheat. And of course, um, because of that, they, 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 their parts tend to fail faster because there's not enough air going in and out of them to maintain that um, water or weather proofing. Um, I think what I'm gonna have to do, and I apologize so much, if you guys can just like hold the, the room for like a minute, I'm gonna force my computer to restart because I wanna start showing These are the technical issues we run into with a virtual summit, guys. Just uh, be a bit more patient. Tom's worth it. I am so sorry. I'm not even going to bother even doing the, the PowerPoint because it's something about that freaked out the, the thing. So I'm going to continue. Um, so everything's working though right now, right? It's not freaking out like it did earlier. You're good. All right. Sorry about that, guys. That's really irritating. Um, Pulling up my notes, just to make sure I don't lose anything important. Okay. Um, so did you guys hear what I said about weatherproofing? Uh, you, the IP67 fixtures tend to fail. 
Okay. Um, it doesn't mean they all fail, just the ones that I've used and uh, friends of mine have used, they have failed faster than other fixtures. Um, please don't let that completely deter you from even looking at it as an option. But when you go to like most theme parks, you'll notice they're not usually the uh, IP67 fixtures, they're usually um, moving heads within a dome. Um, they're just more robust. And all, on top of that, they actually move faster um, than the ones that are waterproof, which is important to me. Now, as far as connectivity, how do you hook up to a moving head? Um, the old fashioned way is a USB adapter. This is a common one made by Entech. It's pretty robust. I don't honestly like anything hooked up via USB because USB ports tend to fail. Um, and when they fail during a show or at a theme park, that's really, really problematic. Um, honestly, my favorite is um, connecting through a Falcon. Most of you guys are probably familiar with um, Falcon controllers. Other controllers have this ability as well, but since I use Falcon controllers, I'm gonna use this as an example. Um, when you have a Falcon controller, you'll have your ethernet ports, um, which will connect directly to your computer, which is a stable port, unlike USB, unless of course you're running through USB, um, A, B, those tend to fail when, you're, when your power turns off or turns back on, those ports can go to sleep and cause problems. USB-C, I believe, has actually fixed that issue. Um, on the side though, you have serial ports. Now, even though they look the same as a Cat5 connection, they are not the same. And you can't see it probably from the video, but there's these little pins um, right here that by default, they're on DMX. You have to slide all three. You have to make sure all three are on the DMX side, not the LOR side, which is a, so you can use a connect directly to a Lightarama port as well. Um, Lightarama has voltage through one of the wires, so you don't want to get it mixed up as it can fry some ports. Anyhow, what you can do is hook up your computer directly to the Cat5. Um, and then from here, you can hook up to a Cat5 to DMX adapter. Here is the DMX adapter. It has a Cat5 on one side and then a female side on the other. Don't get the male version. You need to get the female version because the DMX cable, which looks basically like a microphone cable, but is different in the the amount of impedance carried through the cable. So make sure you get DMX cables, not microphone cables. Um, they're not the same and they can cause um, issues. Um, if you do have issues, by the way, you can get something called a DMX terminator, which you can put up your end of your line and that will basically stop uh, random misfirings on the DM DMX signal chain. Anyhow, um, before my computer freaked out, I was gonna show you some stuff uh, about how to connect to the Falcon and everything. But basically, um, I'll, I'll try to address that indirectly later. What I'm gonna go ahead and do right now is I'm gonna go ahead and show you how a moving head actually operates. So um, I actually put this sign up here not to promote my own business. I needed something black and tall um, right here um, in order to show the light on. If I put something white, the, the beam is so powerful that it'll like, it'll, it'll basically wash out all the video. I'm gonna go ahead and turn on this fixture. These are the fixtures I use. When you first turn them on, they'll run through a reset cycle. They're gonna calibrate themselves, make sure they can move in all directions. There are locks on most moving heads. Make sure those locks are released. Locks in the pan and till. Right now, just calibrated, it looks good. Um, now I'm going to use, for now, I'm gonna use a physical hardware DMX controller because it makes it easier to uh, explain them. Now, when you are running a moving head like this, this is not an LED. LEDs are fantastic for color mixing, but they are not fantastic for beams. And for me, I really try to have a moving head that has a powerful beam. Um, that way I can see it cut through the sky. Um, up to now, the LEDs haven't been powerful enough to really have a bright beam in the air. There might be some new ones. Um, I've, I've heard they came out with a couple, literally just within the past couple months. I haven't taken a look at them, but I run um, basically like a 7R equivalent, which is a 230 watt bulb. And be careful that some of the cheaper ones have cheaper glass, cheaper parts, cheaper motors, and move slower. I'm not going to get into all that. I sell the ones I believe that make the most sense for their value. Now, when you have these kind of beams, so unlike an LED, they need to be lamped on because that bulb in there needs to be arced. So there is a separate channel. This is a 16 channel fixture, which is pretty common for moving heads. The 16th channel is the lamp channel. So basically, on most moving heads, you just put that on to a value of 255, which is the highest value, for about five seconds. One, two, three, four, five. And it looks like it just came on. Um, here we go. It's lamping on, and now you can see it just turned on. Now, 
you have to have it for a few seconds and they do that on purpose because what if you're just happening to move your fader across and you happen to cross over the lamp on channel or even more critically the lamp off channel um and you can accidentally turn it on and turn it off unlike leds you can't just turn these off and on because they arc they they warm up they take a while to get to the right temperature and brightness and then also you need to turn them off when you turn these off at the end of the day um which i'll do later um there's a specific value like I, I believe on this one i put it on a value of like 168 for about five seconds and then it'll turn off again they make you wait five seconds so you're not accidentally turning it off because you would not be able to turn it back on um quickly now what i right now i i put this on a gobo which is basically actually I'll, I'll break it down a little bit the gobo is like a little pattern right now i have it switching patterns and then i put it on a prism which splits it and then I have the, the prism slowly rotating. I have the colors slowly rotating. Um, but, but yeah, so you can just see the little magic you can do. I'm going to set everything to like zero, though, and show you how the moving heads work feature by feature. Now, on a moving head, you have a shutter and dimmer. Um, generally speaking, you can probably leave the shutter on all the time. So I'm just going to take my shutter, put it all the way up. You don't see anything yet because you also need the dimmer all the way open or partially open to see the light. Now, if I do this, you can see that light. I'm turning it off right away because if you're familiar with these moving heads, they're so powerful and so bright. Within 40 feet, if you have them focused properly, they can and will start a fire. Um, they really that hot and that powerful. So right now I have it. I don't have the, uh, the beam open right now. I'm going to go over the most basic pan and tilt. Pan moves it from side to side. So I'm slowly moving this fader and you can see it moving. Most moving heads also have a fine pan, which x Lights does not take advantage of yet, which allows you to do small movements. It's moving ever so slightly, but it's probably hard to see via video. Um, that way you can get really precise motions. Um, same thing with tilt. Tilt moves it up and down. They usually go from a little bit pointed down to a little bit pointed um, down the other direction. Um, the halfway mark, which is 128, would be straight up. I'm going to just basically use my judgment to bring this down over here like this. So now I have the beam um, focused where I kind of want it to be. Um, let me move it a little bit more towards the, the black display behind me. Now I'm going to slowly open the dimmer and turn it off We're almost right away. Let me get this around. Let's see here. All right. Uh, that's good. What I did just right now was instead of turning it off, I put it on frost. Um, better moving heads will have a little filter that'll just basically turn this into a wash so now it's just basically washing this whole area um if i take out frost and have the beam I'm, it'll be too bright too powerful and I actually burn a hole through my poster which i don't want to do um what i'll do is first i'll change the color so it's not so intense which means also less heat um there's usually like a uv sort of setting here we go um I'll use that. Now we can turn off frost. Okay. Now what I can do is I can go ahead and focus this. There we go. Get rid of the gobo. There we go. All right, so even that's actually pretty hot right there. Um, let me change the color again. There we go, we have a mixture of orange uh, and pink, which you probably can't see. Um, now when I change the gobos, you can see the shape's a little bit better. It's at an angle, small dots, bigger dots, different shapes. And what I can do is I can take these weird shapes and I can put them on the prism. I can make it rotate. And I can change the colors and all that fancy stuff. Usually though, I just have it on no color. And the reason for that is because and put on the wash, turn it off while I talk. Um, unfortunately, in the sky, white is the only color that really cuts through regardless of weather conditions. Now, if I have fog, you can do almost any color. The hardest color to do with moving heads in the sky um, is red. Red almost comes, comes completely washed out. Green's okay, blue's okay, but anything towards the red tones, it gets pretty much lost. Of course, white has all the color. So it's much easier for you to see a beam, which I think most people are kind of going for. They're trying to see, how do I get a beam in the sky? Now, if you want to put image images or gobos or like shapes, et cetera, on your walls, 
you don't need to have a powerful moving head. You can get one of those, I think they're like literally 50 bucks, 100 bucks LED versions, as long as you have them pointed to your house or to your display. Those don't need to be nearly as powerful. But in order to compete with your pixels, if you're trying to make something in the air, usually you have to have at minimum a 5R bulb, which is 189 watts. Um, if you go all the way up to like 15R, which is like 350 watts, those are a little bit brighter, but um, kind of like with sound, 50% more power doesn't mean 50% more brightness. Um, it's it's a uh, logarithmic um, formula. So you need way more power to ha have something twice as bright. So don't be fooled by these you know, extreme um, wattages. You probably don't need them and they probably don't show as much as you think. So um, I, I, I think 7R is a good medium. I use that because also it's not super heavy. It can have um, heavy, I mean, super power consuming. I can have four of those quite easily onto a single circuit without overloading the circuit. Now, remember, in addition to the, uh, the moving head beam, you have the motors, which also use um, electricity. This moving fixture, I believe, uses about 350 watts. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on the beam so you know that it's on. And I'm going to take my lamp value, which is uh, this fader over here. And I'm going to put it at, I believe, 168 or somewhere in that range. All right. Now, after a few seconds, it'll turn off. There it goes. And now that it's turned off, I'm not going to unplug the fixture. Um, kind of like when you park your car, you hear the fan still going for a while. It needs to cool off that area. If I just turn off the unit and I don't lamp it on, don't lamp it off properly, it will burn out that bulb way faster and bulbs um, are a little bit kind of, a little expensive for these kind of fixtures. Um, I want to say these are like 70 bucks each, even on a discounted price. If you buy them in the US, they're like something obnoxious, like hundreds of dollars for each bulb. So I'm going to let that fan cool off the fixture a little bit longer before I shut it down. Um, now what I'm going to do is go over a couple rules of thumb. You need to get spares when you get moving heads because they're not like pixels. Well, actually, even with pixels, right? You still have spare pixels and you swap them, but they're less robust because there's moving parts. A pixel doesn't have any moving parts, so it's a lot less likely to fail. Over time, these will get dirty. They'll get gunk in there. And uh, especially if you don't have $6,000 clay packy Sharpies, and even those fail, um, the cheaper the light, the more failures you're probably going to have. Um, they're going to need some replacements. Um, I'm sorry some maintenance, including bulb replacements, cleaning, um, and just replacing bad parts. Um, the worst thing I've ever had to replace was a couple of motors. Um, most manufacturers, um, including um, the ones that we sell over here, they have at least a one year um, warranty on parts. Uh, of course, that means you're not abusing them, right? You're putting them outdoors without any um, waterproof or weatherproofing, you're gonna fry your um, beams. I had a customer once send me beams that were clearly like soaked in water. Um, saying, oh, these broke. I don't know why. Well, I mean, there's water all in it. Anyhow, the nicer the moving head, you're probably happier you're going to be. You don't probably need to buy $6,000 clay packy um, Sharpies. If you still don't like the Chinese knockoffs, which I don't blame you for, um, Elation makes some really good beams. I, I use those a lot at a commercial locations, but still, those are like two, dollars $3,000 a piece. So it's, it's not really a cheap aspect of the hobby. Um, and finally, you don't need FAA, FAA clearance. Now, a lot of people think you do. They think, oh, I live by an airport. I can't run these. These are not lasers. Um, so don't get confused. Um, lasers are a problem because they're this small and they leave the laser and they're only a little bit bigger by the time they hit an airplane. And those can cause um, not only distractions, but eye damage to pilots, right? So that's a big deal with lasers. These are far from lasers. Even when they have like a two to three degree dispersion, two to three degrees, a mile away is it's going to be like a massive light which is completely washed out which at worst it's like when you're driving your car and you see a headlight well no big deal you don't immediately crash into you know a pole or something when an airplane sees a light they don't immediately go down and crash in, you know, into a big ball of flame so it's not something to freak out about of course if you're doing something intentionally that's a completely different story right or if you live so close to an airport which i did in the past you want to avoid hitting the side of um, helicopters and or uh, airplanes as they're going in for landings because if someone's trying to land and they have this bright light right on them that's not ideal or same thing with the, you know, the cockpit that you're coming down 
Um, again, it's so far away, even if you're right next to the airport, by the time you get there, it's probably not going to be a big deal. And especially if they're in motion, um, it's just like a flicker of light. It's gone. No one's going to sweat or, or cause an issue. Um, have you ever been to a grand opening of a facility where they rent those sky tracker beams? Those are thousands and thousands and thousands of watts. And you're running like a couple hundred watts. They don't even get clearance with the FAA. Trust me, you don't either. Just don't piss off anybody intentionally. That's a different story. And of course, don't use any lasers. Lasers are completely different, completely different class um, that is uh, actually regulated by the FDA, ironically. Um, I'm not going to touch that anymore. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to actually open up X lights now, which I'm going to screen share again. Hopefully it does not cause the same problems that it did last time. I apologize for that. Um, it's... Okay, here we go. Let me go ahead and do a share screen. Give me a second. Desktop two. So hopefully you see that screen now. I'm gonna open up X lights. I'll show you what it looks like in X lights as well. If you're an LOR user, I apologize um, for more for multiple reasons, but I uh, I'm not gonna show um, LOR today because it's just a lot more complex. Um, here's what it looks like. Oh, actually, it's been enough time they can shut down this beam so I can you can hear me better. Now it's cool. Um, this room gets hot very quickly with those beams, even though it's a cool temperature today. Um, now I hid the body of my beams. Let me go ahead and unhide it. When you add a move, I'm sorry. Oh, you see this screen right here? Oh, thank you. I appreciate the interruption. Stop there. Um, share screen, let's try this again. I thought I hit desktop too. Does that show the correct one now? Okay, th thank you for that. Uh, my apologies. Um, so when you, if this wasn't here already, you wanted to add it from scratch, I'll show you what that looks like. Okay, I'll head and just go to DMX, moving head 3D and they have moving head. I like to use the moving head 3D version because it shows me um, where it's pointing and then you draw it and then there you go. Um, when you get your moving head, every moving head is different, right? My moving heads use the clay packy Sharpie um, channel layout, but not all moving heads do. Um, so realize when you first set up your moving heads, you have to kind of go through X lights and say, okay, how many channels is it? Mine are 16. Um, pan channel, mine is channel, let's see, 8, 9, 10. So I would put 10 there. Um, Let's see here, 540 is pretty standard for degrees of rotation. Um, degrees per second, you can adjust the speed on it that way, because the computer can make it move instantly to one location versus another location. But realistically, let's just say it can only move 120 degrees per second. I'll just put that generically for now. Tilt channel, uh, mine is 12. Um, tilt orientation, tilt degrees at 180. Um, that's fine for now. Uh, it should be technically a little bit less than that. Um, now on an LED um, moving head or an RGB moving head, you can use red, green, blue. Unfortunately, mine doesn't have any of that. It's just, it uses a color gobo wheel. I'm sorry, not gobo, uses a color wheel um, on channel one that doesn't have every color, but most colors. Um, so unfortunately, X lights is not, does not work well with these kind of fixtures. I mean, you can still control it. You just won't see it on the screen. So I guess it does work well. You just, it just doesn't give you a good visual of it. Um, just I just put everything on my um, three channel, which is my dimmer, um, just so whenever it lights up, it just shows up. My shutter channel is two. Um, my shutter um, open threshold, that's fine. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So basically these become my, my dimmer, if you will. Um, and then that's all I would have to do. Now, let me go ahead and delete this since I already have my setting up. Now, by the way, if you were to set this up in a Falcon, you would want to find your Falcon and make sure it is using like, so for example, I click on my moving head. Um, I'm using universe 16. You have to make sure you, when you go to your controllers that that Falcon is also receiving universe 16, which is my, I guess my Falcon that has ending with 60. And then also when you go to your Falcon, click on your Falcon, um, go to the IP address of your Falcon, tell it to look for Universe 16, go to the serial page, which is like 
either the last or second to last tab and tell it to look on those ports for um, universe 16 as well. Um, if it takes all those things, it takes this to be in the right place, the Falcon um, looking for the universe 16 and also on the serial page of the Falcon to be looking for universe 16 for it to work. Once you have those all set up, you should be golden. Um, so over here, I have these eight moving heads on top of my roof. I'm gonna show you what it looks like and what it's like to program them. Let me go to new sequence. Let's go to animation, 40 frames per second. Let's do just my moving head layout, done, okay. So now I have my moving heads, one through eight. I also have moving head groups. By the way, um, a lot of times when I program, and you should too, don't control them just individually. You can do more cool things if you make groups of the pans, the tilts, the colors, the focus, right? And the way you do that is, by the way, if you look in the upper right corner, like what the heck is all that? Well, these are just basically placeholders for me to see the groups and also to know I'm activating a group. Because let's say, for example, um, I put on the color wheel. You wouldn't know by looking on the XI software, but I would know by looking up there. Or let's say I ran the, um, the gobos. Well, X lights can't do gobos. It can control them, but it can't show them. So at least I have these display. So let me go to like several moving groups. So those yellow dots, those are my colors, the dimmers. And the way this works is you basically have individual star channels. Um, and I'm basically just running this as a, um, like a pixel string. And channel three is, um, how do I say this? Um, it's the first one, channel three of the second moving head, the third moving head, the fourth moving head, all the channel three. So basically I'm making individual star channels so I can just control all the dimmers um, in one group. And of course I have every group laid out that way. So um, the most simple way to control your DMX moving heads is to take the DMX effect and over here you'll see um, these labels. Now I just added these labels um, in there. Like if you go to channel two, it's not there. I can show you. So you would go to your layout. Let's take moving head two. Just go to, I'm drawing a blank, give me a second. Oh yeah, strand note names. So let's just say channel. And over here, I would just basically type it in. Mine are color is the first channel, and then it's shutter, and then it's dimmer, and then it's a gobo, and then it's prism, which basically splits up the gobo. Um, and then it's rotation, which splits, which rotates the prism. And then there's zoom, um, which basically can zoom in and out the rotation. Frost, which basically turns it into a wash. Focus, this is super important um, because if it's not focused, the beam will look um, too wide, too small, blurry, or the gobbles look right. There's pan, there's fine pan, which is the small adjustments of the pan. Um, tilt, fine tilt. Um, I don't think these other channels are used. 14, 15, but then 16 is lamp. So now I hit OK, hit save, go to sequencer, click this, and now it's all there. So let me go ahead and take my shutter. You can always leave your shutter on um, unless you use the shutter specifically. Shutter is good for like flashing the lights, which I never do. Which is, um, so for example, I could even, if I was just doing groups and not doing any individual stuff, I can just put like an on effect on all my shutters, you can see them lit up over there. Um, if I did the same thing with my dimmers, you'd see them all lit up just like that too as well. Um, so when I click on this, I'll have my shutter up, but you won't see the beam until the dimmer comes on. Now you'll see it. And then you take the pan. The pan is how you move from left to right. Go to your ne next group of channels. Um, tilt is up and down. Um, now, the fine pan, fine tilt don't are not controlled in X lights. So even though I put a label there, um, it, it doesn't do that. What if X lights did control it? It would make the motions more smooth. Um, it is a problem when you're controlling moving head. If you try to do too slow of a motion, like I'll show you. Um, by the way, to do motions. Just use your value curves. Like a ramp is a great way of doing that. I'm going to start from one place and end on another place. I want value zero to value 255. That's a full circle, by the way. Um, actually, I'm sorry, I said full circle. It's more than that. It's 540 degrees. Um, so you can see that moving around. Now, let me go back into this. 
Um, it looks like actually that's not um, that's not 540 degrees. I'm not going to um, touch that right now, anyways. But here we go. So now I have this ramp. So I have this motion. But here's the problem with moving cats: if you do this too slow, um, like this, it will actually jump. You see those different jumps? You will physically see that. It'll look like your moving head is shaking because we're not taking advantage of the fine pan, fine tilt. Um, so just don't do super slow motions and then you won't run into that issue. Here's another issue. Um, not issue, just something to look for. I guess I, sh I should be wording that properly. I love x -Lite. Um I'm a huge fan, so I'm not ripping on it. It's But it is free software and it's not something like a Grand MA, if you're familiar, which is like a $100,000 moving head controller. Um, now when I'm running the motion with moving heads, you have to remember, um, it is, if you're looking at me now versus the screen, when, when the moving head's moving, it takes a moment to start the motion. It's not instantly moving and instantly fluid. Um, it's starting to move. And if you have your beam, let's say I wanted to have it move at a specific moment, like right over here it's not gonna actually do that. Because it would actually take a moment to get into motion. So what I would often do, if I wanted the beam to start at, let's say at 20, I would take my dimmer. I'm controlling them all right now, um, which I often do, but I'm not gonna explain that too much. And I would actually start the motion before. So it would actually start the motion and then turn on the beam. Now, let me turn off the dimmer. And they're probably going to have a, let's see, it might have a problem. Let's see if it does. So now it's going. And there you go. It's missing. Why is it missing? Why did my voice go up? I don't know. Um, the reason why um, it's missing is because of the order you have your groups in. This is a problem that I have with customers all the time because um, people don't realize the order that you have these displayed in your master view changes. Um, how the effect will be um, handled. So X lights goes from top to bottom of your master grid, okay? So I'm running the moving head view, but if I go to master view, um, which is still the same, but the problem is this needs to be later or lower in order for it to be thought of after. Right now, this has a value of zero on the dimmer. So even though this has a value of full on, this has a value of zero, this is overriding channel two or moving head two, so it's not turning on. To solve that, I would go to my display elements over here. Oh, it's sorry, it's showing up on a different screen. There we go. Um, and I would take, no, why'd you? Oh, dang it. But it's wanting to <laughs> lock. I think there's a button you press to make it not do that. I can't remember which one it is. There we go, okay. Um, I take dimmers and if I move it to the very bottom, now it will process dimmers after those. So let's see if it worked. Yep, it worked. So basically what I did now was I started the motion. You can't see the motion. And that's why you notice how these little two things, these bulbs came up in the corner. It's telling me there's activity going on. And then the beam comes on. And of course, all the beams come on. Now, I'm going to, instead of, of course, uh, me, sorry, I'm talking fast, making sure I cover all the important information. I have about, let's see here, 10 more minutes of talking, and then I want to go to question time. Um, with the DMX um, function, you can control all the values, of course. Um, before I forget, this is not in the order I wanted to say it, but I'm going to forget if I don't do this. Go. If you need to have, like let's say the beginning of the night, you need to have a specific sequence just to lamp on your fixtures, unless your first part of your show has enough time for it to turn on and um, arc them on. So if I put lamp value 255 and I have it running for, let's say, this is about what, seven seconds, it needs to be on. And then it's, it's waiting, it's waiting. About there, it turns on the fixture and now it's gonna be warming up. So I have a separate, on sequence for all my moving heads. And at the same thing you need at the end of the night. Um, so you basically, let's say you go to a value on mine, it's like 168. I would run this and I would say this as my off sequence. It would run this DMX value on the lamp channel 
for a few seconds. And then about then it would turn off the lamps. I would not power off the units yet. I will let them run for like five more minutes, cool off the bulbs, cool off everything in there. And then I can turn off the fixtures, okay? Something important to remember, I just wanted to tell you before I forgot. Now, of course you can do everything else in here. Um, your tilt, I use value curves all the time, gobos, prisms. It's great to have a moving head by you so you can control them and see how they actually work in person because it's not always the same as on the screen. Um, finally, what I wanna do is I wanna do group effects. So you can actually use various effects. Now I wouldn't we use like a shader on a moving head group, but you can see they actually do fun things. So yeah, I can put on shutters and that basically, remember it, moving heads need the shutter and the dimmer open for them to see them. You're not gonna see it until I put on the dimmer as well. Now you can see the moving head dimmer is on. I'm gonna put it over here, okay. Um, what if I wanted the dimmers to go on and off in like a cool wave? Well, let's just take bars and then and then let me go, let's see here, right. And then let me turn on white and black. And now let's increase the cycle. Let's go ahead and add a, a 3D. And now you can see I've used the bars effect to have this cool effect over here. What if I wanted to take something similar and actually make the, uh, the tilt beast do something fun? little fast, right? So now I have this cool design where I have the moving heads doing this crazy, you know, crazy shape. I can actually use the colors over here to get different values. So right now I'm having white, right? What if I had, um, let's see here. What if I went to 50%, what would that look like? Not what I wanted. Let me go to this. Let me experiment with that. And now it's not as big of a shape. So there's different ways and different ways you can experiment. I use bars a lot, um, not the kind you go drinking to. I mean, the ones in here. Um, let me change the cycle, slow it down. Let me also, yeah, there we go. So there's different ways of doing this. Let me go back to 100%. Um, you can do, uh, basically I use um, different effects on the pan and the tilt. It doesn't work so well on other things, you know, like color um, focus, focus you want to set. Like, let's say for example, I, I set up my moving head and I learn that value, blah, 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 is a great value to have. I might have just even an on effect um, or I can have the DMX effect as well, which is easier to manage and then in this case, all eight of these are just the different focuses. Like, so for example, if I know value one, oops, 100 is the ideal focus for my beams. And by the way, your beams could be different. It could be like, oh man, this one has a different focus and this one needs 120 and this one needs uh, 240. It'll never happen that dramatically. And seven, right? Um, <clears throat> you can set up your focuses and just have this at the beginning of all your sequences because beams aren't always that perfect. Um, on a really expensive moving head, you can set it um, and walk away. But on the X lights, what you'd have to do is just put this in at the beginning of every sequence and just run it. Now, of course, you want the focus to change because you're hitting walls um, and sometimes going out to the sky. That's different, right? Um, frost, we went over it, basically turns into a wash, gobo. Um, you won't see it on the screen, but you can see it in real life. Um, yeah, and I think that's like the basic stuff, right? Um, and that's how you control the moving heads in x -Lite software. Um, also keep in mind moving heads, um, especially um, th these kind of fixtures, they use a dimmer that is similar to how a camera aperture operates. So if you can look at my hand versus what's on the screen, um, it'll actually close up like a camera. I can't physically do this with my hand, right? But basically, um, it takes a moment. So if you were to open up the aperture, open up the beam, right? It's not instantly on as fast as a pixel, pixel will go on. It'll actually have a mechanical motion. Something finicky that I have to often mess with is you might look at my sequence and be like, why is this moving heads like turning on before everything else by a 10th of a second? Well, to make it actually physically light up at the same time of my pixels, I sometimes have to take everything at the very end 
and compensate and drag it over just a small, like a frame or so, depending on how fast or slow your moving head is, to actually line up so it looks the same. So that's something you kind of learn with the experience. Um, now, remember, like, uh, just because it shows on the screen that way doesn't mean it will actually happen that way in real life because moving heads react slower, right? That's why oftentimes when I release new sequences, um, I don't have the moving heads just yet. Toward the end of the season, when I ha actually have my moving heads all set up on the roof, I actually go in and add moving heads. Um, and then when they're added, I just put them on the website for free for if you already have that sequence. Um, the reason why is because what it looks like on the screen and what it looks like in person is often a very different thing. It's a great starting point. I mean, I can do really cool things and get it lined up or get most of the effects lined up. But to get them finalized, you really got to do that in person. And I don't want to release like stuff I know is just bad. So I wait till the end of the season to actually work on the moving heads. Um, I think that's it for all the stuff that I think is necessary for cover. Um, we have about 15 minutes left. So I think it might be a good time to open it up for questions. Um, oh, by the way, um, I have a buy one, get one free sale. If you just use the code summit, summit sale for this weekend, if you wanna go get sequences, I, wanna, I don't wanna push my business or anything. Um, but I just wanted to throw that out there in case you guys are interested in getting any sequences. Let me open it up to questions. Um, I'll go ahead and stop the screen share. Um, yeah. Um, anybody have a question that I can answer? By the way, is it, are the questions in chat or do I? Okay, let's see here. I am so sorry. I didn't actually hear the question. Could you repeat that? Yes. Yep. Yeah, okay. Um, and now I will share the screen again, and hopefully I will not lock up my computer. Um, okay. So basically, you see the screen, right? <laughs> okay. You can just grab anything, just grab a string, right? Um, and then say eight, like I have eight, eight moving heads, so I'll have eight pixels. And then you'll go to, um, you'll set up your channel so they line up with your moving heads. Like, so for example, if I was doing color, um, it would be universe 16 channel one, which is the first thing, right? And then what I do is, individual star channels. Oh, do I have to maybe get rid of that? Why isn't that letting me click it? Am I going crazy here? I should be able to click that box. I don't know if it's because of what I just typed in. By clicking that box, you know, right? Let me see if I did it differently over here. See, um, I don't know why I assume that number of strings eight. What is that what I have to do? I don't know. Number of strings, eight nodes, one. Oh, that's probably what it wants. That's why. Let's see. Yep, there it is. Okay. So I have eight strings, one light per node. And then I would just basically say, this is, you know, uh, universe. Like there's different ways I can say universe six one and line them all up. Takes a little bit of time the first time, but then this is basically going to display and I can change um the appearance of how it looks to make it look how I want so I can recognize it. But that's how I can monitor um, the moving heads, even if I can't see it. Because for example, in the past, especially when I used LOR, I would have like a color on and I would never know that I accidentally had like some data there um, because it was so hard to see um, the way the LOR handles it. Even X-Lights, um, you could have like some artifacts and not even realize it until you're running your show. This way I have something to, visualize if there's any artifacts that helps a lot. I use that a lot for other kind of fixtures too. So um, like when I have like, uh, let's say I think there's a, this might be a geyser. Oh, it's my old centering dot, I don't use it anymore. Um, but I have a geyser over here. Um, I'll use like little lights to show them um, because you can't, you know, actually see a geyser or like, you know, like fog actually in x light. So I just create things like that to show it. Hope that, does that kind of answer what you're looking for? Hey, Tom, got a quick question. Um, how, when you were saying you turn on your dimmers in the beginning, um, I'm sorry, you turn on your lamps with yeah. the sequence, how do you get the DMX values to persist across your, your entire show? I mean, once 
the effect is over, doesn't it? Just you DMX for that channel go to zero. Oh yeah, so DMX values zero on a lamp channel won't do anything. Um, so ninety nine percent of your show won't have anything on the lamp channel. Just when you want to power something and power it off, do you ever use that channel? So I won't even turn it on during a sequence. I'll just turn it on during an on sequence. Um, so when, so by default, all your um, lamp channels in your sequence. Um, let me click on this, for example, right? Oh, that's actually on a group. Let me go to something else. If I went to moving head, um, channel 16, which is lamp, it would be off. Let me go, let me go to this where it shows it. Um, I'm not going to have a value there. So it's not going to mess with this. As long as I don't mess with it, it's not going to change the state that the lamp is in. Okay, so that's my question. So as long as you don't change the state of a DMX channel, it'll persist to whatever the previous state was across sequences? Yeah. Your lamp will stay on or it will stay off. Is that true of all the DMX channels or just lamp is a special case? Oh, lamp, uh, lamp is a special case. If, if you go to anything else, it needs that data all the time. So um, if I have tilt at 220 and then it loses signal, it will actually go, everything go back to zero. It needs the value constantly um, to be in a certain position. Got it. So how do you, uh, yeah, I got a question. So I'm gonna have three moving heads on top of two, three template sticks of, um, of ham radio trust. And what I was thinking about doing was having like pinwheel, like pinwheel gobo go up and down the street, but the street at that point, it's not just a simple left and right, you know, pan, pan numbers. There's gotta be a, a um, uh, there's gonna have to be a, um, a little bit of vertical movement to stay on the street. So is there a way that you can create like a starting point and a stopping point for that particular effect? And I think generally speaking, I want it to go back and forth for certain parts of my dance songs. Uh, so would you just use value curves or what? Yep, it's, it's, it's basically a value curve, it's a ramp. Um, so I would go to my tilt, for example, and I would say I want it to, like, I mean, depending on what you want, right? Y'all want to start it at this value right. and mid, midway through this value and end on this value. And then you can kind of have like a little bit of a hill um, with just a tilt. And that's how you accomplish that. And that value curve is, is uh, just for the pan and then you would do the same thing for the uh, tilt as well? Yes. I got you. That's definitely going to have to be done on site. Yeah, exactly. You learn it as you go, but you'll also learn certain things. Like, so for example, I don't drop my tilt below 40 because if I drop my tilt below 40, I start to hit windows. Um, mm -hmm. And I know there's a lot of jokes in this industry about neighbors who are being difficult and then they'll purposely turn buy more pixels. And um, you can't do this with moving heads. Um, it's a whole nother level. And well, no matter what, honestly, you shouldn't do that with anything. I mean, you're, <laughs> excuse me, I get on my um, milk uh, crate for a second. Your, your neighbors like need to be respected above all people. You, you can't say you're doing this for the community and screw over your neighbors in the meantime. It's just, you're doing it for yourself at that point. But if you really care about your neighbors, you can be thoughtful and you're not going to try to run schedules that are ridiculous. And when it comes to moving heads, if you ha light a moving head in someone's window, you're blinding them like inside their house, even with a, with a, the blinds closed, especially if you're using like a professional moving head. Um, you got to be thoughtful and you need to figure out where the windows are, where certain things you need to avoid and you need to avoid them because as obnoxious as our hobby is without moving heads, when you get moving heads and they're shining for miles on average, these beams go uh, at least in my location. And with these particular beams, I can see them for eight miles in every direction. Like <laughs> that kind of attention is a, a, is a whole nother level, right? You need to be respectful of the community, respectful of people, um, and be careful of where you're shining them, which is, again, why I do so much of the programming when I'm actually physically in front of them. Um, I try not to program at like 2 a.m. because if I do um, and I accidentally hit a window, I'm, I might be waking somebody up. Even if I'm not hitting a window, if I'm hitting a tree behind a window, that tree is so bright, it's lighting up their bedroom. Um, so it's just really important to be thoughtful of neighbors and other people, um, even if it's not 
technically illegal, you can become a nuisance very quickly. And once you become a nuisance in people's eyes or attitudes, it all goes downhill very quickly. I'm lucky enough or blessed enough to have all of our neighbors supportive of our show, even though we average a few thousand people here a night. So it's really important that we um, really respect our neighbors and do our best to um, alleviate and diminish any impact that we are making on them from the show, especially with the moving heads. Sorry for the long answer to a short question. Well, if, when, while you're still on this ramp, does it, in your experience, if you'd have a ramp, does it literally look choppy and robotic as soon as it gets to that top value and starts going the other direction? Or is it kind of like a, a fluid motion? Depends how slow it is. The speed changes that. And you'll notice every movie has to right. So if it's a if it's a really slow ramp, it's going to be choppy for sure when it gets to that top and bottom. Um, because there is going to be a stop and then a start. It's not going to be instant, right? And I, you kind of already kind of sense it yourself. I can see that, um, you know, because basically it's a belt drive. So it's going to get to one point and turn around. It's not a transmission <laughs> with a clutch, you know what I mean? Um, where it's going to like slowly like change direction. It's, it's not going to do that. It's going to be, so you, you just going to mess with it to see what actually looks right. Thank you. No problem. Hey, Tom, I've got a couple of questions. Um, I have about, well, for my next year's show, um, I'm going to be running about nine DMX moving heads. Um, what brightness would you recommend for, say, maybe like a couple hundred feet? I don't want to blind my neighbors, for one thing. Um, so what brightness would you recommend for DMX moving heads? Um, there's no um, number that would I could say that would work. I, I got to tell you, though, it's probably 100% brightness. You're going to need it. If you're trying to create a, well, are you trying to create a beam? Yes. Okay, you're going to need every every <laughs> drop of brightness you, you can sacrifice on it. Because trust me, um, to create a beam, you need um, everything but you just need to make sure that beam doesn't hit something. The brightness of the beam itself won't piss off people. Like if they see a beam out in the sky, that doesn't bother them, right? It's when the beam hits something like their window or a tree that the light is reflecting off of. That's when it's a problem. So basically hundred percent brightness if you're trying to go for a beam, but just don't hit their window. Don't hit. You can probably hit their house if it's not going to reflect, you know, I, I hit houses or roofs if it's not reflecting onto um, a window. Um, right. But just, yeah. But no, you need, you trust me, you're going to need hundred percent of it. Um, and even at hundred percent, if you have a night with no particulate matter in the air, it's going to go down dramatically. Your show will change from night to night, um, depending on how much moisture and how much dust is in the air. Okay. All right. Thank you. By the way, your sequence is, is like amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. About four more minutes. Does anyone else have any questions? Oh. Okay. Uh, I had one question. I see somebody already asked it on the chat, but um, oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't even seeing the chat. My apologies. I, I mean, it wasn't mine, but I'd like the answer to how do you get um, if you use professional software, like even like the free ones, like Freestyle, or they've got pattern generators, like circles and figure eights and things like that. Yes. How do you do a circle? Or you just use the ramps or and, and tweak it? Or is there an easy way a to do it? A circle is hard. <laughs> I won't lie. A circle is hard because it's going to take a starting ramp, a middle point, and end. Like, so it's going to take something like this um, for your tilt and your, um, and your, and your uh, let's see here. Let me just take that value right there. So um, I guess other than trial and error and hitting those set points, I mean, there's, I mean, there's no shortcut that you found doing it. Um, I, I usually don't do circles because it's <laughs> not because it's hard because they, they don't do what I need them to do as far as uh, like what I'm doing like a in, in the sky a circle um, like do you see what's going on in the over here on the screen um, yeah a circle won't come across as a circle unless it's right around a person or the opposite direction of a person but when it's up in the sky it won't look like a circle because it's going to look more like going back and forth and a little bit of variation. Um, circles are great when you're lighting up something, but when you're doing um, if with a beam, it doesn't get perceived the same way, if, if that makes sense. It does, sort of. 
Mm-hmm. Like, well, if you look at, like, if you look at this right here, right, when it's just going back and forth, if I change the tilt, it, it, it won't, it, it, like, you're like, oh, I, I, I can see they're trying to make a circle, but it's not going to look like a circle because of the way that. Well, I can see how it wouldn't look in, in this 2D environment on the screen, but in real life, think, I would think you'd be able to do a figure eight or something in the sky. I think Actually, in real, in real life, it doesn't now. work that way. I, um, I, it, because of the infinity perspective, I know what you're saying, but like when you actually see it in person, you'll see what I mean. Like when it changes from going up and down tilt, like pan in front of you is really obvious, right? But tilt is not obvious. Mm-hmm. And in addition to that, the brightness of your beam will change dramatically depending on the direction that the beam is going. If it is going right at you, right? You see that whole, um, you see all that light. But if it's going like sideways, right? You're only seeing through four to six inches of light, which is not a lot. So when you're shooting a light sideways, it doesn't, is not perceived as bright. If you're pointing it away from the audience going up to the sky, you're seeing through a lot more of that tube of light, which makes it much brighter. Per- thanks, uh, thanks, Tom. We're going to have to um, move this. No problem. Thank awesome. you. I hope you enjoyed.